Good afternoon and welcome to The Road to Recovery, The Road to Freedom with Mark. It is indeed afternoon, Friday the 2nd of October. Bang on 12.30. My 28 minutes every week. And uh, The Road to Recovery is about mental illness. And I know you hear a lot of stuff about mental illness these days, but my show is one of the originals that's been running for many, many years without sponsorship, by the way, uh, which we could certainly do with. But it's nice to see people jumping on board. And I was very, very struck the other night. I was watching a program hosted by uh, Mariana Hond Sunday, and Stan Walker shared his story of his early life, which was an incredibly brutal upbringing and I must say you know it was an exceptionally brave thing for that young man to come forward with his terrible story. I understand that he's um, teamed up with Mike King now and I must say you know it's something that Stan Walker didn't have to do. He could have simply got on with his life now that he's rich and famous and whatever but he had the decency to share his story so that we can bring into the light the problems that we have faced in our past. <clears throat> you know, people talk about the good old days, but growing up for me wasn't that good, and it wasn't for Stan and it wasn't for a lot of other people, young people who got brutally beaten, raped, went through a horrendous upbringing. And the interesting thing with his father, that was very interesting more than anything else. Um, you know, he was brutalised himself, supposedly much worse. But the really interesting thing to me is when he looked at that camera and he said, yeah, when I was taking it, I knew I was just biding my time until it was my turn. And I thought, yeah, that's that's it in a nutshell. Violence begets violence. Perpetrators make more perpetrators. People don't suddenly decide that they're going to beat the bejazzers out of their children. They do it because it was done to them. And so they are simply continuing the violation, the damage, the destruction as a result of what was foisted upon them. Now, that doesn't excuse what they do. You can break that chain of violence. And Stan Walker has done that, and he hopes to become a father, and I must say what a fantastic father he will be because, like his song Bigger, he's risen above that and not sought retribution to harm anybody for the harm that was done to him, but simply be bigger to step up and say, I will not be party to this, to preying on young boys to beating my children. None of this will happen in my generation. It stops here. And I truly believe now we are coming to that point as a society where we are bringing all of this out into the open because when it is hidden, that only helps those who say to their prey, shh, this is our little secret, don't tell anyone. You tell anyone, we'll get in terrible, terrible trouble. And so the victim starts to blame themselves, and this is what Stan was saying, that he hated himself so much for what was being done to him. He blamed himself. And that is the hardest part for a young victim who is easy to manipulate and to poison. And what happens with the victims is... They blame themselves for what's happening to them, at least to some degree, and often quite a lot. And that's what really does the damage, is the fact that they feel trapped and that there is no escape and that they are somehow to blame. All of this makes the victim mentally unwell. This is what breaks people. This is what tortures people's heads, is the fact. And, you know, Stan said... His cousins just laughed at him when, when he spoke about this. He tried, you know, and that only makes it worse. People who laugh at other people's suffering 
only makes that mental illness even worse. How that boy is alive today, how he didn't commit suicide, I do not know, because that would have been the easy way out, the escape for that poor boy. You know, I remember the first time I ever watched Tiger Waititi's Once Were Warriors, and I cried not because of the movie, but because I knew that was true, that kids do kill themselves because of the shocking things that happen to them, because... They see that as the only way out. And what we need to do is give those kids somewhere to go, someone to speak to, an opportunity to escape the hell that they're in and know that it's not their fault and that there is a way out and that we can eradicate this kind of thing from society. Maybe not completely, maybe not 100% overnight, but we work on it. We work on it, work on it. And the more we talk about it and the more we bring it to light, the more victims will see it's okay to come forward and there is someone who cares and there is someone who will help. And that makes a huge difference. Unfortunately, man's inhumanity to man is a common thing and altogether too prevalent in society. The way we disregard, disrespect and maltreat each other is really quite sad when you look at it. There's not many species on Earth that treat each other so badly. Normally, you know, there is all this talk about love and protection and looking after a child. You can absolutely guarantee that if that child doesn't get what they need, they will be maladjusted and that will impact not just on them at the time, but their entire lives, their partners, their children, This whole thing will have a knock-on effect that will go through that person's life and their partner's life and the next generation will be affected by what happened to that person. So this is not like someone can just spill their guts and it's all over Red Rover. It doesn't work like that. It takes a long, long, long time. And you never fully heal. You know, the cut. That might come right, but the scars, they're always there. And it's those scars that stick with someone for so long, a lifetime, it never, ever, ever goes away. It's not all better now, you know, kissing, it's all better now. It doesn't work like that. So it's getting people to a point where they can see some positivity and start doing some positive things for themselves in a world that is free of that nightmare, it swirls around you and consumes you completely when you are in that situation, and you think there will never be any way out. And the thing is, to give people hope at that point, to say, look, yesterday might have been bad, and today might be bad, but that doesn't mean that every single day for the rest of your life is going to be bad. There is something we can do. And people who have experienced things like this are good people to talk to because they have lived through it. They are the survivors. And they can give you handy help to get you to a better place. And I so often encourage people to do simple things which you take for granted, going for a walk down by the river. It's very hard when you're suffering from depression. You want to lock yourself away from the world. And that feeds on itself. The more you lock yourself away, the more desperate you become, the more isolated from society. The more you go out, the more you are reaching, looking forward, looking for positivity. The more you close down, the less chance you have of ever getting out. You get into that rut, you cannot break out. So taking those first steps, those first positive feelings that little germ of positivity when you go for that walk and you feel the sun on your face and the fresh air and you see the birds and the fish and it just lifts your spirits that little bit that is that first little start and if you can encourage someone go for a walk with someone right who you know is suffering a bit it it doesn't mean they have to be in the depths of depression they could just be a bit down and all somebody needs is a little bit of positivity in their lives and that can encourage them to take the next step and the next step and build a better future so it's all about 
taking those first steps and putting positivity into people's lives. Often, it's not just that person, but the other people that they are surrounded by. Drug abusers, violent people, evil people, they need to get away from that as well and into a world of supportive, positive people who genuinely care about that person. And a lot of the time, the people who are most badly damaged or indeed kill themselves are those people who don't have those good positive influences. So if we as a society can make that available, just a text or a email or a phone call or whatever away, they know that they can reach out, that there is someone. I remember when I was in the depths of depression and, you know, I rung the suicide hotline and no one answered. That's what happened to me 15 years ago. There's no one on the end of the line. You're on your own, son. You're either going to use that piece of rope or you're not. That's what it came down to, and it should never get that way. It should never be there. Things are changing, and they're changing for the better. But I would hate to see this become a fashion. You know, today's fish and chips and tomorrow's newspaper, gone and forgotten in another few years. I really hope this thing has legs. And I think with people like John Kerwin and Mike King and Stan Walker standing up, people who have influence, <coughs> a reputation, some degree of respect in society, intelligent, genuine men who can show a bit of vulnerability and say, you know, I've been through some troubled times and these are my experiences and this is how I came through and you can do it too because... We're all in this together, regardless of what race or religion you might be, what creed or colour, it really doesn't matter. We are one, one people together. And if we let our young people fall, that damages us to some degree. It damages our society. It makes us callous towards others, uncaring, inconsiderate. And so our society becomes a shitty, shitty place to live. And it was for many young people, and I didn't get the worst of it. Some of the kids I know grew up going to, kicked around from foster home to foster home, used and abused, and eventually ending up in, what could I call the Pony Boys home? Just hell, maybe even worse than hell. And those kids ended up drug abusing criminals, many of whom are dead now. And I knew these young people growing up. Some of them were friends of mine, even in my adult days. And to see those people so damaged, I think, you know, no one ever deserves to be treated like that. And so I think we all have to step up. It's no good to turn your back and walk away and say, it's not my problem, because it is. If you are in the society, then it is your problem. And if we work together... We can certainly do a lot to heal a lot of the damage, help a lot. It will never completely go away, but we can make great inroads. And don't these young people deserve a good life? I think they do, surely. As good as me? Yeah, too right. So if you can do a little something, anything, even a smile can make a difference. And most of the time, it doesn't cost you anything. You know, a little bit of kindness, a little bit of consideration, thought and effort. And that can be the best thing, the best thing of all. Right, I don't just talk about mental health. I read stories from my travels overseas to show people that just because you suffer from mental illness doesn't necessarily mean that you can't achieve things in life. You certainly can. And because I was such a wild, crazy and to a high degree damaged young man, there was no way I was ever going to fit into my society. I will always be an anathema to that society. So I decided to go on some wild adventures and I spent seven and a half years travelling around the world and just having a wild, wild time. I never really intended coming back, but my family drew me back in the end, and I'm very glad they did, because I truly love this country. 
Um, but my stories are about my adventures to prove to people that you can have a life. Just because you suffer from mental illness, from depression, bipolar, it doesn't matter that you have some kind of mental illness. You can still do so much with your life. You can still achieve so much. You know, Jimi Hendrix used to write stories about depression, but boy, those, those songs that he wrote, they were just phenomenal. Winston Churchill, the greatest orator of the last century, suffered terribly from depression and yet went on to become the prime minister of his country and drag his country through war, a tower of strength, when it was needed. That man suffered very badly from depression. They, he used to call it the black dog sitting on his doorstep, always watching. And yet he achieved such great things. Many, many people in history have. So it's not all over, not by any means. You can still achieve great things in your life. And one of the wonderful things, I wouldn't necessarily say great, but wonderful things that I achieved was the running of the bulls, and that's my story today, so let's rock. Every long hot June in Pamplona, Spain, they indulge in an age-old tradition. The town triples in size before the locals let the bulls loose on the crowd. In an organised kind of mayhem, they block off a route through the medieval part of the town. At the bottom of the hill, they release the bulls from a huge set of wood and steel gates. This starts at dawn, and anyone mad enough to choose to run the course must run for their lives along the course to the arena. The tourist shops are full of postcards with pictures of terrified locals and tourists alike dodging rampant angry bulls. You can't help but laugh at their dilemma, yet a twinge of trepidation creeps in, knowing that it will be me tomorrow. We send a few of those cards to friends with funny comments and false bravado. We had made it to the first day from San Sebastian, where five of us in a combi van had been partying hard, watching reruns of Catch-22, and old bullfights where matadors get gored by bulls. Drinking the local sangria all night and dancing. Pamplona, for one week, would be party central. Celebrations bordered on the religious, but of the five of us, only myself and Seedy were up for the ultimate challenge, the bull run itself. The others were happy to eat, drink and party all night. We had found a large river frontage where we set up camp and other combi vans were drawn like moth to flame until it resembled a village. Seedy and I decided to check out tomorrow's route so we had an idea of what we were in for. After checking out the tourist shops we decided to walk the route we would run the next day. It was very hot, the sun belting off the high stone walls and cobblestone streets. The roads were narrow and afforded little to no protection from oncoming bulls. Getting some distance on them would be crucial to making it to the arena in one piece. About halfway along our walk in a pretty run-down, dodgy-looking part of town, a tubby guy with a big broad smile caught my eye as he happily whispered, hashish, in my ear. What was that I said? With a smile and he, as he produced what looked like a large ball of horseshit. What do you want for that, I, required, I inquired suspiciously. It worked out at about 40 British pounds, so I took a smaller lump for 10 quid. The chubby Moroccan chap seemed pleased and promised to catch up tomorrow. We may be as high as kites by then, I'm used to seedy. After stocking up on booze in the form of sanguia and cheap wine, we headed back to Combi Village, which was walking distance to a bar where we set up headquarters for drinking and planning. After spending all afternoon eating and getting liquored, we headed back to camp and lit up a fire. Remembering my dubious purchase of hash in my pocket, I asked Seedy and the others if they wanted to go. Pretty soon, we were all stoned as crows, staring at the fire and giggling like fools. Not only was this shit real, it was as potent as could be. There was plenty to go around and still more tomorrow. 
We turned in before midnight, determined to get up before dawn and head into town for the running. We slept fitfully, our thoughts filled with eagerness for the bull run to begin, and Seedy woke me whilst it was still dark. I climbed into the passenger seat and rolled up a massive spliff. Seedy got behind the wheel and refused my eager offers, so I ended up massively stoned by the time we got to town. We parked up near the start of the run and hurried down to the start, reassuring each other and laughing like kids. Once down on the start by the huge gates, we donned our red neckerchiefs, as was the local custom, to show bravado in the face of fear. The three-minute alarm bell rang out amongst what was by now a huge crowd, and in the panic, many of the foreigners started running up the hill from the gates to a huge amount of derision from the locals and those of us foolish enough to stay. The locals whipped into a fervour of dancing and shouting, waving rolled-up newspapers in the air, and before too long the gates were opened and the bulls released into the waiting crowd. The locals set upon the bulls, whacking them on the shoulders with the rolled-up newspapers, which cranked up the bulls no end. Upon seeing this, I tore off up the hill so fast my feet barely touched the ground. The crowd was not far behind, leaving the confused and angry bulls to follow slowly as the steep slope slowed them down. Now I understood how we would stay ahead, I relaxed to a jog and took in the scenery. All along the road people were crammed onto first floor balconies, overhanging the narrow streets. They shouted and cheered at the top of their voices, waving and throwing stuff, and I waved like a football player who'd just scored a goal. After a short while, Seedy caught up with me. Better get a move on, they're catching up, he shouted over the din. We both picked up the pace and looked back to see the bulls had reached the top of the hill and the crowd beginning to part around them. Already bodies were beginning to fly or dart away from the angry beasts as they began to pick up speed. Once on the flat, the bulls were outpacing the runners and began to reel us in. With our progress impeded by the crowd, it soon became obvious that we would be caught and a palpable sense of fear swept through the crowd with lots of shoving and shouting. A few more hundred metres and the bulls were upon us. I looked back to see bodies flying and made a dive into a 150mm doorway entrance while Seedy dived into the gutter covering his head. That same look of terror from the postcards painted on our faces as bodies flew in all directions and the bulls rumbled through. After a few seconds, the panic moved forward and realising we were still in one piece, rejoined the melee from the rear, shouting as more bodies got poked and trampled on. We followed the mayhem up to the arena at the end of the course, broke off and entered the arena. Inside, a crowd gathered in the centre as the bulls were corralled outside, then allowed to enter one at a time. The crowd in the middle formed up in a V-shape toward the oncoming bull, which would either shy away or go ploughing straight in. When a bull ploughed in, the crowd would scatter in all directions, people zigzagging and running in tight circles to keep clear of the bull's nasty horns. As the crowd got more drunk, some took to sitting at the front of the V and one or two took a horrible beating. The ambulance outside did a roaring trade all day. I was far too stoned to join the mayhem and was quite content to drink, shout and be entertained by the crazy crowd down on the sand. No television could do justice to the fun we were having, watching the bulls wreak a little revenge on the crowd. So we watched until the proceedings ended, then wandered back to the centre of town for more partying. The streets were overflowing with bands playing traditional music and people dancing, drinking and shouting. At the centre of the throng was a place called the Muscle Bar, with a square full of people and a statue where people started climbing and doing 
crowd dives off the top of it. People below were catching them as best they could, but many were falling through and getting smashed up on the cobblestones below. They would then be dragged off to the waiting ambulance. All five of us had met up by now, so we tried to catch as many drunken fools as we could until our arms became too sore, and we left them to the inevitable fate of their stupidity. As the night of smoking, drinking and dancing wore on, it all became a bit of a blur, but somehow someone managed to drive us back to Combi Village, where we lit a huge fire and shared the rest of my premium Moroccan horseshit. The day of the first running of the bulls was over for us, but I vowed to stay on and watch some more, along with one of the bullfights scheduled for that week. The Bullfight the day after our first running of the bulls, we rose quite late and decided to catch an afternoon of real bullfighting. It was another scorching hot day, so we took plenty of water and drove the combi to town. I had very mixed feelings on the way up the hill. On the one hand, I was going to watch some fine bulls being slaughtered by a matador and his cohorts. It would happen with or without me. To be absolutely fair, I had to go, for fear that I miss out an essential part of this cruelty debate. Right, I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit here, folks, because I'm running a bit short on time, so please bear with me. Right. We'll just crack on down through here. The b As we went to watch the bullfighting, what I came to realise, it is not so much the death of the bull, but the blood of the matador. That is what the crowd truly bay for. And that afternoon, we saw just that. In the third match of the day, a large bull was set upon by the ranks, yet seemed to hold up well against the early spears. The young matador stood proudly in centre ring, unfurling his cape and doing some passes which became closer and closer. Still the bull showed great stamina and kept charging relentlessly. The crowd grew restless, even booing the poor matador. A chant of Toro, Toro now started up, and still the bull continued to charge. With great urgency, the matador performed a little longer than made up his mind, revealing the rapier to deliver the final blow. But he was wrong and the bull stole too fresh. As he came forward with his sword, the bull charged again. The rapier glanced off the bull's shoulder and the, matador, and the bull hooked the matador cleanly in the guts, lifting him off the ground. The crowd as one leapt to their feet, shouting, Toro, Toro, at the top of their voices, as the matador staggers to the ground. Visibly shaken, he regains his composure and tries to deliver the fatal blow a second time. Once again he misses, the bull picks him up and smashes him into the ground, almost running him through with a horn. The crowd is whipped up into a frenzy as they bay for the blood of the matador. Badly damaged, the matador staggers to his feet to try a third time, and to all our dismay, the bull is killed on the third lunge of the injured matador. The magic has suddenly ended, yet it is unlikely the matador will ever fight again after his failure at this fight. The poor dead bull is dragged out of the arena to claps and cheers for his bravery, and I realised another dimension of bullfighting that was not previously appreciated. I look back on those hot days of Spanish summer wistfully. Time and distance turns the perspective to the finest and most memorable pieces. The feelings of adulation and terror mingle with such humour, fun and dancing. Life well lived with passion for the moment, and one bite lasts a lifetime. Well, that's me for another week. I won't be here next week. I'm going to have a week off, so... I'll be missing you, but I'll be thinking about you. I hope you think about my show, and in a couple of weeks' time, I'll be rocking on again. So thank you for tuning in. Thanks to the sponsors, Michael, Veronica, Warrapper Radio. I'll see you all again later. Bye for now.